There are a lot of things that make Naruto incredible. The fights, the character development, the dynamic between all of the characters. But genuinely, if I had to sit down and say that there's one thing that separates Naruto from all other anime, I would say it's the villains. See, because while Naruto does have a myriad of incredible fights, and it does have some of the most compelling and interesting character development arcs in all of TV and anime history, really when it comes down to the thing that separates Naruto from the chaff, is its villains. Whether that be Donzo sticking his grubby hands in all the affairs of Konoha to lead to the Uchiha massacre, Itachi traumatizing Sasuke early on in his life by killing the entire clan but then later being revealed to be a good guy the entire time, or Nagato trying to dispense as much pain onto the world as possible so that everybody could be united through that shared feeling. Really when it comes down to it, every single villain in Naruto is not only incredibly compelling but also very unique, as some are broken heroes, some are victims, and some are just straight up evil. And while their backstories, motivations, and powers might differ, they all serve one collective purpose, and that is making Naruto an incredible story. But of all of the villains in Naruto, who truly rises to the top? What villain in Naruto stands above the rest as truly the greatest villain in all of Naruto history? Well, obviously that answer is gonna change depending on the person you talk to, but I believe that most people are in pretty universal agreement of what the hierarchy of villains looks like in Naruto. And while there might be some minor key changes, I think we as a fan base are all aware that some villains are better than others. Thus today, the purpose of this video is to try and explain what that hierarchy of villains is. Because today, we're talking Naruto's best villains, ranked and explained. But before we get to talking on Naruto's best villains, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like the idea of me ranking and explaining things from anime, you're gonna love my other channel, The Weeb Commander, or instead of ranking and explaining things from Naruto and Boruto, I rank and explain things from everywhere. And if you don't wanna see me enter my villain era, guys, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Otaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you guys wanna look like the good guys of the story, go ahead and meander on over into my merch store, Otaku'sAnonymous.net, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, sweatshirts, and sticker packs known to man. But before we get into all that, Today we gotta talk about a brand new sponsor to the page, Bomber Grounds. Bomber Grounds is a free to download iOS, Android, and Steam game. Bomber Grounds asked the question, can you blend a battle royale with a classic Bomberman game? And the answer is yes. Bomber Grounds encourages you to strategize and survive and explode your way to victory in this explosive battle royale. And the more you survive and explode your way to the top ranks, the more you level up your character. The more levels you accrue, the stronger you get. But be careful with the character that you choose because each character has its own unique abilities to find the character that fits your play style and pop into the brand new season that just dropped. And don't worry if you have other friends that love Battle Royales or Bomberman games, you can play with your friends. And if you're already a player of Bomber Grounds or seeing me talk about Bomber Grounds has inspired you to download it, leave your user ID under the pinned comment on this video and Bomber Grounds is gonna go through those names and select a few to receive some free gems. So what are you guys waiting for? Download Bomber Grounds Reborn from the link in my description and get to exploding your way to victory. So so before we get into this listing of the greatest villains in all of Naruto, I'd like to lay down some ground rules. See, there's a lot of villains in Naruto, and I mean, like, a lot of villains. There's the entire Akatsuki, there's the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, there's the Sound Village Five, and if I'm doing my math correctly, and quite honestly, I may not be doing my math correctly, that alone is 22 villains. And mind you, there's still probably about eight to 10 other important villains outside of those groups. So in today's video, we're gonna try to avoid members of the Akatsuki, and we're gonna keep the list to only important bad guys. See, because well, obviously the Seven Swords into the Mist have played a massive role in the history of Naruto. To the story of Naruto, they're objectively not all that important, especially when you consider the fact that six out of seven of them were killed by Mike Guy's dad. And while I would love to get into the weeds about how much Raido is a better character than Fuguki, that would bore me and you. But Nick, why are you avoiding the Akatsuki? They play an incredibly important role in the history and story of Naruto. You're right but they also kind of deserve their own video. So one day, possibly one day soon, we'll do a best members of the Akatsuki ranked and explained. Listen, when a list gets beyond 15 entries, the video gets to be about 45 minutes. And concerning the fact that somebody's gonna be leaving America for about five weeks in a month, I unfortunately don't have time to film 45 minute episodes. I know. I know, but if you want to sit down the love of my life's family who are Chinese and tell them that I won't get to spend my first ever Lunar New Year with them because you guys need 45 minute episodes, then please, be my guest. And like I said, the Akatsuki deserve their own video. Anyways, on to the list. Because while I know I said I wasn't gonna include groups on this list, coming in at number nine, we have 
the Sound Village 5. But here's my caveat. They all exist on the list together. See, because while Tayuya and Kitamaro and Sakon and Ukon had such commanding screen presence, let's be real, they'll always be viewed as a package. And while Kimimaru is the one member of the Sound Village 5 who could be considered a separate entity from the Sound Village 5, that's favoritism. And we don't do that on this channel. Yes, we do. So if you want to consider the Sound Village 4 as our 10th entry and Kimimaru as our 9th entry, then be my guest. In fact, that probably would have been pretty smart considering the fact that we have nine entries on this list and that's insane. Now, technically, the Sound 5 doesn't exist, or at least by the time that we're introduced to them in the Naruto universe, they don't exist. Which is why by the time of the Sasuke Retrieval arc, they're known as the Sound 4. However, because Kimimaru does end up being involved in the Sasuke Retrieval arc, I usually refer to them as the Sound 5. The, in an actuality, you could even refer to the Sound 4 as the Sound 5 because Sakon and Ukon share a position, but are definitely two separate people. Now, the Sound 4, as we know them, came into be through essentially a battle royale, or at least this is what was shown to us in the anime, as Orochimaru just had a pit of children that he told to kill each other, and the Sound 4 were the only people left standing, and as such, they were elected to be Orochimaru's bodyguards. Now, Kimimaru never had to go through this because Orochimaru found Kimimaru in the wild. After Kimimaru's clan, the Kaguya clan died in a battle against the Mist Village, and after these four were selected to be Orochimaru's bodyguards, in order to make sure that they understood that they were not on top of the power sphere, Kimimaru battled against all four of them simultaneously and won, thus making Kimimaru the leader of the Sound 5. However, as Kimimaru's mystery chakra illness got worse and worse, he had to step down as leader, which is when Sakon and Ukon decided to step up as leaders, making what could either be considered the Sound Village 5 or 6, depending on how you consider Sakon and Ukon the Sound Village 4 or 5. And a lot of people don't know, but Kimimaru was involved in the Sound Village 5 basically up until the Konoha Crush arc, because once again, we saw in the anime, the Sound 5 helped Orochimaru in the assassination of the fourth Kazekage, Rasa. And it wasn't until after this assassination of Rasa that Kimimaru came down with his mystery illness. And therefore, Kimimaru was truly only a couple of weeks away from being involved in the Konoha Crush arc, which gives us some perspective as to how fast his mystery illness moved. Now, obviously, the Sound Village 5 are minor antagonists in the Konoha Crush arc and to the major antagonists in the Sasuke Retrieval arc, but even though they're around for pretty much half of the important episodes in Naruto, they really failed to leave as lasting an impression as all other villains in Naruto and Shippuden. See, because while all four of them are incredibly intimidating, and they push the Genin team that was chasing after Sasuke to their absolute brink, they are somewhat forgettable, but they're not all equally forgettable. See, the problem with the Sound Village 5 is that they're all dependent on the curse seals that they received from Orochimaru. So they all have basically the same transformations, being able to enter their version 1 curse seal mark mode and their version 2 curse mark seal mode. And we saw these same transformations with Sasuke later down the line. And while there's nothing wrong with these transformations, as they looked cool and they made them all more powerful, unfortunately, it did kind of make them all meld together. But even with that being said, there are members of the Sound Village 4 slash 5 who stick out way more than others. Obviously, Kimimaru is the most memorable out of all of the Sound Village 5 slash 6, as Kimimaru Shikatsumiyaku was something like we had never seen before in the Naruto universe. And on top of this, Kimimaru was involved in one of the greatest fights in Naruto history, Drunk Lee versus Kimimaru. Not to mention that Kimimaru had been brought up as a genius child who was going to be the perfect vessel for Orochimaru. And he lived up to that hype as he was able to battle against Lee and Gara simultaneously. And Gara up until this point had seemed all but undefeatable. And yet Kimimaru, just with the ability to make his bones leave his body was able to battle against Gara and Lee simultaneously. And when you take all of that in consideration side by side with the fact that Shikatsumiyaku is just sick looking, I mean, the man can make a spine sword, then yeah, you're going to get a very memorable character. But unfortunately, when it comes down to it with the other sound four, the reason that they're memorable is because of the battles that they were in with their respective Geni, or Chunin if you're Tiyuya. And genuinely, the sickest moments of those fights come from the good guys. Whether that be Tamari cutting down an entire force with her weasel summoning, Choji's first ever butterfly mode after eating the red pill, or Nechi killing Kitamaru with a gentle fist strike through his own strength. Well, none of the Sound Village 5 are truly all that forgettable when it comes down to it. The reason that they're remembered is because of the people they were fighting, as pretty much every single fight in the Sasuke Retrieval arc was a coming-of-age fight for the person involved in it. And thus, when it really boils down to it, the Sound Village 5 were kind of just stepping stones. So, they get last place on this list. And coming in right above last place at number 8 is the final boss of Naruto Shippuden. 
Kaguya. Uh, Nick, you often talk about how Kaguya wasn't as bad for the story as people say she was. And I do say that, because Kaguya probably gets more hate than she deserves. Well, I do think that the final boss of Naruto should have been Madara, and after Madara was defeated, Kaguya should have taken over his dying body. Kaguya herself isn't actually a bad character. She just gets a lot of hate as a villain because of the circumstance in which she was introduced, which was, objectively, the wrong circumstance. But hey, Kishimoto wanted to wrap up the story in 700 chapters exactly. Couldn't make it longer to make sure that Madara got an actual good ending. Because sure, while the introduction of Kaki, it does basically turn everything we know about the Naruto universe onto its head, as we learn about the beginnings of the Naruto world and Kaguya descending down to the world looking for divine trees and chakra fruit. We learn about her falling in love with human, we learn about the humans falling out of love with her, her using infinite Tsukiyomi on the entire world, eating a chakra fruit, gaining chakra, having children, introducing chakra to the entire world through the medium of Hagoromo and Hamura, being sealed by Hagoromo and Hamura, Hagoromo going on to be the sage of six paths, Hamura going on to live onto the moon, and then eventually create Toneri. And sure, while a lot of this is rushed and feels like jargon comparatively to the rest of Naruto's story, Kaguya herself is a pretty compelling villain. An alien who descended down to the world and fell in love with somebody there, and tried to live amongst them. However, after showing humanity just how powerful she was, most specifically showing Tenzo, her husband, just how powerful she was, humanity turned on her. And thus, she turned on humanity. Which then led her to become instantly resentful of the two children she had with humanity, who represented the only people on Earth who ever had the chance of being able to defeat her. And thus, she started a months-long battle against those two sons. But the circumstances in which Kaguya was introduced really do mire just how cool of a villain she is. I mean, she is essentially the god of earth, the person who was able to introduce chakra. Not to mention that she also has a myriad of incredibly sick abilities. She has the ability to rip parts of dimensions and pull them to her current location. She has ash all killing bone, a kicking moro that allows her to turn anything her bones hit into dust. To do the first ever infinite Tsukiyomi, she quite literally opened a dimensional rift in the sky because earth didn't have a moon yet. Not to mention she is quite literally the only female antagonist in Naruto of any worth whatsoever. Outside of the Akatsuki, Konan is also really cool. But when it really comes down to it in canon, there's only four female villains. And those would be Kaguya, Konan, Karin, and Toyuya. For some reason, Toyuya decided to not start her name with a K, so I guess she's not a member of the Kardashians. Even though the circumstances in which Kaguya was introduced weren't great, I still think she's a cool villain. However, unfortunately, against all of the other villains in Naruto, she doesn't stack up all that high. And yes, I put her even lower than our number seven spot, because coming in at number seven, we have Kabuto. See, on this page, we had a long-standing beef with Kabuto. And to this day, he's still one of my least favorite characters in all of Naruto. However, after we did a You Know Nothing on Kabuto, I softened up to him a little bit. Doing a deep dive on his character and his motivations made me realize that... He's actually a deeper character than I originally thought. An orphan who was found on a battlefield by a woman by the name of Nono, raised in the Konoha orphanage alongside all the other children of war. Found with a head injury, he had no memory of his past life. And thus the orphanage was the first place that Kabuto was ever able to make memories. However, unfortunately, the now most important person in Kabuto's life, Nono Yakushi, was an ex-member of the Root. And while Nono treated patients with her medical ninjutsu that she learned from her days in the Root to fund the orphanage, it wasn't enough money. But it did teach Kabuto a lot about medical ninjutsu. And because Donzo knew that Nono didn't have enough money but wanted to fund the orphanage, Donzo decided to threaten the orphanage's funding if Nono didn't turn over one of her orphans. To enter the route, that is. And Kabuto, hearing this, decided to join the route, where eventually he would come across an enemy combatant in Iwa while spying there. And after cutting her down, he realized that that Iwanin was actually Nono, who died in his arms as he tried to heal her, not recognizing his face. And unfortunately, these kinds of things would continue to happen to Kabuto over and over and over again. Every single time that Kabuto got close to somebody, they would either treat him with complete disdain or die on him. It happened to his parents, it happened to Nono, and over and over again, when he was at his most vulnerable, people would take advantage of him. Donzo yanked him out of an orphanage, Orochimaru yanked him out of the root, and thus every single time, Kabuto had to adapt to the situation around him, until eventually after Orochimaru's death, for the first time in his life, he was left without a guiding light. There was no one for Kabuto to follow blindly. He had free will for the first time, and thus the first thing that Kabuto did was try to become the guiding light that had just left him. Which is why Kabuto melds the flesh of Orochimaru onto his body and takes all of the Keke Genkai from all of the people that Orochimaru has ever gathered under his cave roof. And in that moment, he becomes an amalgamation of everybody that him and Orochimaru have ever been in contact with, including Orochimaru. And it's in that moment that Kabuto becomes a physical representation of his lack of ability to be his own person. And thus, while every single time the Kabuto comes on screen, I get infuriated. That's the mark of a good villain. Kabuto has been around since the tuning exams. He managed to defeat Tsunade, sort of. He's the first person that Naruto ever hits a Rasengan against. He's the reason that Madara is in the fourth great shinobi world war. Well, 
Kamala's on-screen presence might be infuriating, he is absolutely one of the cogs that turned the wheel that was Naruto. Not to mention, his Dragon Sage mode is kind of sick, as not only is he a Snake Sage with the ability to breathe life into inanimate objects, but he also has all of the Kika Genkai of the members of Taka and the Sound 5, which makes him a rather formidable opponent for Itachi and Sasuke, at the same time. So love him or hate him, Kabuto is unfortunately an integral part of the tapestry that is Naruto. And while he's probably more integral than the next entry on our list, I just like the next entry on our list more. Because coming up at number six, we got Zabuza. I said, I'm aware that Zabuza is in Naruto for less than 20 episodes, as by the end of the Land of Waves arc, the quite literal first arc in Naruto, he's dead and gone. And while he does come back to the medium of Edo Tensei in the fourth great Shinobi World War, it's not for long and it's not that important. But here's the thing. While Zabuza might not have spent much time in the story, he is the reason the story got to be as long as it was. Because while sure, Kabuto probably played a grander role in the plot of Naruto, I would argue that Zabuza played a grander role in the continuation and popularity of Naruto. That is to say, if you were to cut Kabuto out of Naruto's story, I think Naruto would be fine. Cut Zabuza out, and I don't know if I can say the same. Zabuza, while he might seem like a simple antagonist, is quite literally the reason I was like, oh, anime is sick. Because whether or not we're talking about his incredible character design, the fantastic fights he has against Team 7 and Kakashi, or just the incredible jutsu that he shows off, showing us what's truly possible in the Naruto universe, Zabuza cemented that Naruto would be around for a long time. See, Zabuza, while sick looking and powerful, was also incredibly complex. As while he was known as the Demon of the Mist, he abandoned the Mist because he believed it had become too violent, a violence that he had propagated before even joining the Shinobi Academy of the Blood Mist Village. As even before becoming a student, Zabuza killed 100 Academy students, after which he was known forever as the Demon of the Hidden Mist. However, Zabuza's act of violence in this moment was so over the top that it actually stopped the Shinobi Academy from making the students kill each other, and thus in a way Zabuza helped change the Blood Mist Village, and Zabuza would continue to strive to change the Hidden Mist Village. See, because well, obviously as Zabuza was one of the Anbu members of the Hidden Mist, he stumbled upon Haku, who he trained to get better with his Ice Kekka Genkai to make into the perfect weapon, Haku softened Zabuza, until eventually Zabuza fell out of love with the way that the Blood Mist Village operated. So Zabuza gathered a group of people that were also disenfranchised with the Blood Mist Village and led a coup that might have been successful if he wasn't betrayed by one of his own. And thus, when Team 7 stumbled upon Zabuza and Haku, they're mercenaries, doing anything they can to survive. And it's over the course of Team 7's battle against Zabuza that Zabuza begins to realize that the reason that he's surviving is for Haku, which is an incredibly humanizing moment for somebody known as a demon. Zabuza's character development arc is done so masterfully that honestly, classes should be taught on it, and it set the pace for just how truly incredible Naruto's villains would end up being. But unfortunately, because he dies a tenth of the way into the first part of Naruto, it's hard to put him much higher than this, as other villains just have more opportunity to build out their backstories or do villainous things. And a great example of somebody who had plenty of time to be a villain is our next spot, because coming in at number five, we have Obito. Yeah. Obito's only halfway up the list. I don't think he's that great of a villain. Listen, while I do believe that Obito is massively misunderstood, as a lot of people believe that the entire reason he started the fourth great Shinobi World War was Rin's death, which it wasn't, I don't think Obito's as complex a character as people give him credit for, at least within the confines of Naruto. Obito's motivations are very hard to separate from a lot of other villains' motivations in Naruto. Like, yeah, you fell out of love with the way that the Shinobi system worked, and now you want to break it down to the medium of the fourth great Shinobi World War? That's the motivation of everybody in the Akatsuki. And while I understand that the reason that a lot of people in the Akatsuki have that motivation is Obito, the reason that Obito has that motivation is Madara. And while obviously Rin's death at the hands of Kakashi was Obito's jumping point, but that's not his entire motivation. And therefore, when it really comes down to it, Obito's entire life up to the fourth great Shinobi World War was his motivation for wanting to kick off the Eye of the Moon plan. But at the end of the day, the reason that he got caught in that alt-right pipeline is because he watched Kakashi kill Rin. So like, sure, well, obviously on the road to the Eye of the Moon, plan, Obito was able to collect more grievances to use in an argument against Kakashi as to why the shinobi system had to be destroyed, but when it really comes down to it, he saves Kakashi, he's abducted by Madara, the first thing he sees is Kakashi kill Rin, doesn't ask any questions, never tries to go back to Konoha, and then pretty much in that moment decides, you know what, that stranger who abducted me is right. I'm just going to listen to him, I'm going to do his plan, and I'm going to build up my whole life of villainy. Except for the fact that after Madara died, Obito had no plans of bringing him back to life. So it's not like Obito even liked Madara all that much. But Obito, regardless of whether or not I like him as a villain, does have some incredible moments, especially as Toby. Whether it be his battle against Conan, his battle against the eight-man squad trying to find Itachi, him helping Sasuke in the assassination of Donzo, or any moment when Obito ever switched from his Toby voice to his Obito slash Madara voice, Obito does 
does have some incredible moments, and without Obito, the story of Naruto cannot be told. And let's not forget that White Mask Obito is the reason that Naruto is able to kick it up to KCM too. But really, when it comes down to it, the second that Madara is introduced in the fourth great Shinobi World War, Obito takes a backseat. And well, obviously, after Madara is introduced, Obito gets to be the Ten Tails Jinchuriki, but he gets defeated by a majestic attire Susano. And then he switches sides. And while I'm switching sides is kind of a cool moment, it's also kind of a flip-flop. Like, you're telling me this entire life of villainy that you lived crumbles the second that Naruto's like, hey man, I was on a swing. Which is especially ridiculous when you consider the fact that prior to talking to Naruto, he had talked to Kakashi, his best childhood friend, for a fair amount of time. And while one can make the argument that the fight and subsequent conversation with Kakashi broke down a couple of the walls so that Naruto could truly break the dam, but I don't really love when villains flip-flop. But I don't really want to use the flip-flopping thing against him because I do believe that Obito gets his justice, as Obito obviously sacrifices himself to save Kakashi's life against Kaguya's ash all killing bow, which I do believe is a good conclusion to his arc. So points for being important, points for being funny as Toby, points for cool fights as Obito, like his battle against Konon, or White Mask Obito versus Naruto, but points attracted for becoming the second antagonist as soon as Madara was reintroduced, points deducted for not having the greatest motivations of all time when it comes to villains in Naruto, and points deducted, but once again added on for flip-flopping, but also having a good end to his story. Which all in all leaves us with a thumbs up. He's fine. He's not my favorite. Genuinely, I think as a villain, he's a little bit overhyped. But you know who I think is underhyped as a villain? Our number four spot, because coming in at number four, we have Orochimaru. Man, I feel like when people talk about their favorite villains in Naruto, no one ever brings up Orochimaru. And sure, it's because he's creepy and he kills children, but it's not like he's a protagonist of the story. Orochimaru is one of the most complex characters in all of Naruto, point blank period. An orphan brought into Konoha and raised by Hiruzen. A child genius acting as the foil to Jiraiya. A war hero of the second and third great shinobi world wars, where he realized the true horror of the shinobi world. More specifically, he realized that without the knowledge of all things jutsu, that he wouldn't be in control. See, the straw that breaks the camel's back that is Orochimaru becoming evil is the death of Tsunade's little brother, who was on Orochimaru's Genin team. And it was in that moment that Orochimaru realized that if he knew more about Jutsu, he would have been able to save him. And thus Orochimaru commits himself to trying to learn everything there is to know about Jutsu. However, the commitment to the bit here is a little bit too strong, as Orochimaru goes through any means possible to try and learn everything there is to know. And thus somewhere along the way, Orochimaru loses themselves, doing human experimentation on children to try and reactivate Hashi Shirama's wood jutsu. However, all the while Orochimaru is doing this, they're still battling for Konoha, to the degree at which when Hiruzen was electing a fourth Hokage, Orochimaru was in serious contention. However, Hiruzen, apparently a good judge of character, decided that Minato would be a better fit. And if you want to say that you can't tell the story of Naruto without Obito, then you definitely can't tell the story of Naruto without Orochimaru. Because without Orochimaru, the entirety of part one of Naruto, which is the better part of Naruto, does not happen. The tuning exams, Orochimaru is truly the biggest bad, placing a curse mark on Sasuke as he identified him as a potential perfect vessel. The Konoha Crush Arc is entirely orchestrated by Orochimaru, who manages to kill the third Hokage, one of the strongest men in the history of Konoha. The Sasuke Retrieval Arc is because Sasuke is trying to get to Orochimaru, and Orochimaru is the entity that keeps Sasuke separated from Naruto for the majority of the show's runtime. On top of this, Orochimaru is instrumental in making Sasuke strong enough to kill Itachi. All the while, Orochimaru is mastering jutsu people didn't even know existed, not to mention running from Jiraiya and the Akatsuki simultaneously, successfully. I mean, Orochimaru Orochimaru went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sasori's third Kaze Kage puppet with the Edo Tensei version of the third Kaze Kage. They've survived two separate clashes with Itachi. They were such a threat that Sasuke knew that they would have to kill Orochimaru while they were weakened. And without Orochimaru, the four Hokage don't come back in the fourth great Shinobi World War, which means no Minato and therefore no Naruto. Because if we'll all remember, Minato is able to extract his half of Kurama and put it inside of Naruto, which keeps Naruto alive. And while some could make the argument that Orochimaru flip-flopped, they objectively didn't. Orochimaru gets sealed with the Sword of Totsuka, comes back at the beginning of the fourth great Shinobi World War. Sasuke, at this moment, is way more powerful than Orochimaru. Sasuke then says, hey, I prepared you a new white Zetsu body that'll keep you alive forever. All you gotta do is use Edo Tensei to bring these four Hokage back to life. And now, while Orochimaru does technically do their research with the backing of Konoha, it's not like they've gotten less evil. Mitsuki is a human clone, and there are dozens, if not hundreds, of Mitsukis. Not to mention that Shin Uchiha, one of the first antagonists of Boruto, is a of Orochimaru's creation. So they've never changed, they're never going to change, and they've only gotten way more powerful with the years. And that's why, to me, Orochimaru is one of the most important and coolest villains in all of Naruto. But I would still be a fool to put Orochimaru above our number three spot, because coming in at number three, we have Nagato. Oh, Nick, I thought you said you hated it when the villains turn good. I do, but Nagato is an exception. But Nick, 
Why is Nagato an exception? Because Nagato never wanted to become a villain, so switching was only natural. Nagato is the perfect example of what happens when you push somebody until they break. In essence, Nagato is supposed to represent what westernized cultures referred to as terrorists. And while most people can absolutely agree that terrorists are usually in the wrong, what people tend to ignore when saying this rhetoric is how the terrorists came to be. So did these terrorists wake up one morning and decide, oh, I want to flatten Konoha? No. That's not what happened. What actually happened is that at one point, Nagato was leading an incredibly peaceful Akatsuki, whose entire goal was to raise enough money and grow enough power so that they could unify the hidden reign and spread world peace, until eventually a much more powerful nation realized that if that nation unified and became powerful, it would pose an actual threat to us, and therefore they decided to pit the Akatsuki versus the standing government of that nation so that they would cannibalize each other. And surprise, surprise, they did exactly that. However, the Akatsuki, not being stupid, realized that Konoha was responsible for killing not only some of their friends, but also destroying the dream that they all had together. And thus, the Akatsuki got radicalized by an outside factor known as Obito. And thus, Nagato, who, by the way, has a much more compelling reason than Obito to be upset at the way that life has gone for him, decides that he still wants to unify the world, but now through a different means. Because while the original iteration didn't necessarily have a way that they were going to bring about world peace, Nagato realized that if everybody on Earth knows what pain feels like, they'll never want to go through pain again. And while the doling of that pain seemed to be heavily focused on Konoha, and to me at least is a thin failed rationalization of a revenge plot, it's still a compelling and unique motivation. That makes sense within the confines of the character, because not only was Nagato an orphan who watched his parents get cut down, but he was also bestowed a power that he didn't fully understand, was ultimately kind of abandoned by Jiraiya, and then was forced to kill Yahiko, quite literally his closest friend. All while trying to accomplish, and I'll remind you of this, world peace. So yeah, he got kind of pissed, and... Can we blame him? Konoha aren't the good guys. Never have been. And while what Nagato did in the second iteration of the Akatsuki was objectively very bad, he started to do those very bad things because a very powerful nation, Amer I mean Konoha, pushed him to his breaking point. Because no human wakes up and goes, oh yeah, let's go squish an entire city. Without a fair amount of somebody poking them in that direction. For those of you who don't know, America armed the Taliban. They were a freedom fighting force in the Middle East when Russia was engaged in what was essentially their Vietnam War. And thus to undermine Russia without actually fighting Russia, we essentially treated the Taliban like we're currently treating Ukraine. And then we got real grumpy when they wouldn't give us our guns back. So yeah, Konoha's America. It's not that complicated. So yeah, when Nagato uses Rini Rebirth to bring everybody in Konoha back to life, that makes sense, because it was never his actual values to kill innocents. Oh, but Nikki was never Obito's core value to kill innocents. Obito watched one friend die, didn't ask questions, and then almost immediately turned around and killed his sensei and his wife. Not to mention he killed the entire Uchiha clan, who had nothing to do with the death of Rin. And while some people will say that Obito was an orphan, we just don't know that. His parents could have been in there. But yeah, genuinely when it comes down to it, if you told me that Nagato was your favorite villain in all of Naruto, I couldn't fault you. He's complex, his story is interesting. I think his argument for everybody feeling pain is a bit thin, but his character development is fantastic and I love what he as a character stands for. Not to mention he comes back through Edo Tensei and plays an absolutely massive role in the fourth grade Shinobi World War. Well, like not like a massive role, but he has a cool fight against Naruto killer B and Itachi, where he shows to everybody just just how truly terrifyingly powerful he was. However, when it comes to being a great villain, power isn't all that matters. Because coming in at number two, we have somebody who's objectively weaker than Nagato, but just so much more villainous. Because coming up at number two, we have Donzo. Boo, boo. Yeah, yeah, I know, everybody hates Donzo, and you should. That's what makes him a good villain. See, while there's many characters in Naruto who believe they're doing the right thing, and Donzo definitely falls into that categorization, you can kind of understand the logic for every other character who thinks they're doing the same thing. Madara, Obito, Nagato, and the rest of the Akatsuki are trying to enact the Eye of the Moon plan because they believe it'll bring an individual heaven for everybody on Earth. And while in the long run they're being taken advantage of, they don't know that. But Donzo operates simply under the precedent that he's doing what's good for Kodoa, which is just merely a personal opinion. There's no higher goal like heaven for everybody on Earth, he just wants wants what's best for Konoha. And since Zanzo kind of looks at Konoha as an extension of himself, he kind of just wants what's best for himself. Which makes sense when you consider the fact that all he really wants is to be Hokage, and he's basically willing to do anything to accomplish that feat. Whether that being sending children like Yamato to assassinate his childhood best friend Hiruzen, making the information that Naruto is the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails so everybody in Konoha could come together in hatred of a baby, helping Orochimaru with all of his human experimentation so long as Orochimaru would give him the Shinuchiya arm that he would need to plant stolen Sharingan in, orchestrating the assassination of the entire Uchiha clan, creating the Akatsuki by trying to destroy the Akatsuki, or simply just running an underground organization filled of child murderers, who only 
answer to him and not the Hokage. Oh yeah, and did I mention that he slowly but surely brainwashed Nono Yokoshi into not recognizing Kabuto anymore? And then orchestrated Kabuto killing Nono so that he could be a true Anbu member? No, I didn't mention that. Okay, well, now you know. See, because while Donzo says he's doing everything for the Leafs, sometimes he just does things that just seem evil for the sake of being evil. And I love that. I feel like with modern day anime, we've truly forgotten that villains should just be bad guys. They should be despicable. You should hate them. Their motivations should confuse you. And while the occasional, oh, they're just a lost hero villain is somewhat interesting, having a character that you can just hate with the entirety of your body is true storytelling to me. Because here's the thing, there's a fine line when making a character wildly hateable. Because if the character's too hateable, they become unrelatable. Let's say every single child they see, they just punch in the face. You're gonna begin to expect them to be the worst when whenever they have the opportunity. However, if the character is evil for a vague reason that you don't necessarily understand, but you see how they could come to that conclusion, that is the sweetest sauce available. And it makes their death all the more satisfying. Which is why Sasuke doing whatever walk he does behind Donzo right before he cuts him down is one of the greatest scenes in Naruto history. And while there's a couple of moments of Donzo being like, oh, I just wanted to be like you, Hiruzen, at his death, it absolutely does not redeem anything he ever did. And ultimately, Donzo giving his own life in a suicide explosion and that suicide explosion doing absolutely nothing truly symbolizes how Donzo lived his life, destroying the things around him for the greater good of nobody. I mean, this man yanked an eyeball out of Shisui's face and killed him to just use the ability of that eyeball once. And it was against Mifune. And Donzo is supposed to symbolize what a massive governing body with unlimited power and no checks will do when you give them the chance. And that is destroy everything around them for the vague notion that they're helping their own nation. And because of that, Donzo is quite literally the realest villain in Naruto, point blank, period. He's Dick Cheney. He's Henry Kissinger. He is true, powerful evil. And because that true, terrifying evil is represented so well on screen, yeah, Donzo's got to be pretty high on your list. But unfortunately, even Donzo doesn't match up to the number one entry on this list because number one is always reserved for Madara. See, even though Madara didn't get the ending that he deserved in Naruto, Madara is obviously the greatest villain in all of Naruto and maybe a fair chunk of anime. Well, I don't believe that Madara is the greatest villain ever. I do think that he deserves to be talked about in the top two or top three anime villains of all time. As the entirety of Naruto and Naruto Shippuden slowly but surely built up to Madara's return. A prophesized terrifyingly powerful Uchiha who fortunately died a hundred or so years ago. Except... He didn't. Madara is such a legendary character that just seeing his body in an Edo Tensei casket struck fear into Obito's heart. He was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with 20,000 shinobi. He was the only person that Hagoromo ever compared to himself. As he awoke his three Rinnegan state, he was ascending to a level that only the Sage of Six Paths had ever achieved. He defeated all five of the Kage simultaneously and exacted revenge on Hashirama, his eternal rival. Really, when it came down to it without a boost from Ninja Sky Daddy, Naruto and Sasuke didn't stand a chance. And when it comes to playing an integral role in the history of Naruto, no villain has played a bigger role than Madara, as Madara was not only one of the founders of the village, but also a possible first Hokage candidate. Hashirama's best friend, who defected from the village, captured Kurama, and battled against Hashirama to the death. The first person to awaken the Rinnegan since Hagoromo's death. A man capable of summoning the ghetto statue down from the moon in his old age. And a man who orchestrated one of the most asinine plans in history to somehow succeed. I've done videos about it, but Madara's plan was one one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. Oh yeah, I'm gonna give my ring on to this child and hope that one day they give up their life to resurrect me. And if that doesn't work, other child that I've only known for a year, make sure that you steal their eyes and give up your life to bring me back. Oh, neither of you did that? Thank God there's this random snake man who knows Edo Tensei who could refix my body. Because even if you had used Ready Rebirth to bring me back to life, there's a fair amount of possibility I would've been brought back as an old man. Awful plan. But his inability to make plans never really got in Madara's way. Because behind Madara was Black Setsu making actual good plans. But whether it be legendary speeches, fantastic voice acting performances, or just Madara being a menace for over 200 episodes, his presence needs to be talked about whenever you talk about the greatest anime villains in history. Because how many other people have dropped a meteor on top of another meteor? How many other people have used fire styles so incredibly powerful it took an entire platoon of water users to nullify it? How many other people have gained access to Limbo, a parallel world that exists with Earth? Madara is truly one of the greatest to ever do it, and if he's not at the top of your list, he should should be close. But what do you guys think? When you think of the greatest villain in all of Naruto, what's the name that pops into your head? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Listen, 
I think we can all agree. The real greatest antagonist in all of Naruto's history is Gurren, the original Crystal Girl. 